So this is an example of a video, a short video that's actually short. <laughs> so I'm on this channel. I don't have that much to say about this topic, but maybe it's a little bit deep. Maybe it's a little bit interesting. Maybe maybe Melissa can, can throw in some thoughts. I'm wrong. I got... Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you've been warned. <laughs> I got a message from a supporter on Patreon, and he asked the question, sincerely enough, uh, why don't I talk more about global warming? I have had a couple of videos about global warming. The main one I remember was actually in response to Vegan Gains. So I'm sure you can get it on the Vegan Gains playlist. My responses to it disagreements to Vegan Gains. Uh, there were some technical and scientific issues I wanted to talk about in relation to global warming in that video. And it's come up a few other times. But anyway, he phrased this question in such a way as, global warming is such an enormous issue. It's an issue that's going to have consequences for you and me and the next generation, and my own daughter, et cetera, et cetera. So why not say more about global warming? Now, I think you already know my answer on this this topic, babe. And, you know, for me, the answer to this, it's a little bit deep, a little bit interesting, because it's part of the frame in which I've lived my entire life. Like, if you ask the question, why did I end up studying an obscure language like Pali and not ancient Greek or Latin? One of the main reasons was my perception of the world back in 1997, was that there already was an enormous, well-funded establishment dedicated to the study of ancient Greek and Latin. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you know, now I'm much more cynical and well-informed in 2018. Looking back now, probably I could have been a scholar of Latin and Greek and set the world on fire and brought those people's on that didn't already have. But like from my, you know, podunk ignorant perspective in 1997, I thought, okay, there already are these specialists and experts devoted to ancient Greek and Latin, and they probably started studying those languages at age 12, and I'm never going to be able to compete. So why would I try to compete? Yeah. Why I wouldn't I try to do something instead positive for Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Laos, these places that don't... I think it's probably why you don't talk about nutrition, because you're not <laughs> a nutritionist. You're not, you don't talk about right. global warming, because oh, you're not okay. a climate scientist. Right. Like, you but, know, there, there's, you, you, but there's you, something implicit there. It's not just that I'm not a nutritionist. It's that there is an establishment yeah. of well-funded, well-educated experts who are in that field and who make money out of it, right? I mean, like, the fact that I'm not a nutritionist is not enough of a reason not to speak about it. But now contrast this. Okay, when I wrote my first articles, my first public, published articles dealing with politics in Laos, was I a great expert on Laos or Laotian? No. Was I a great expert on humanitarian work and corruption, political problems in Laos or Southeast Asia? No. But nevertheless, I was one of the best informed people in the world who spoke English as their first language. Yeah. There's, there isn't an establishment. Like, there's an establishment of experts in Greek. There's an establishment of, Greek, of experts in Latin. There's an establishment of experts in nutrition, right? Yeah. And, and may, in all three cases, they may all be not cases. I mean, they now I'm older and I'm more cynical. In 1997, I didn't see it the way. In 1997, I never would have thought, you know what? You know, the guys doing these studies in Greek and Latin, you know, this is all garbage. And I can wipe the slate clean. And I can replace this with new and better scholarship. Today, I probably would have responded to that more ambitiously. And I would have wanted to challenge that establishment. But from my more youthful perspective, it was like, well, why challenge it? Why reduplicate the efforts that are already there and so on, right? Situation like Laos, situation like Cambodia, situation like Pali scholarship, ancient Buddhist scholarship, not the case at all. I mean, in many ways, those are still fields where, you know, there's no competition. They're still in their infancy. There is no establishment. The very few translations that are out there are terrible. The very few sources and resources and where my perspective and the information I have to share may really be invaluable in the sense that there's no substitute for it. There, weren't, there were not five other people in Laos who could have written the article I wrote about corruption in the, you know, in the charity industry. There weren't, you know. And, of course, I met the other people who were there. <laughs> you know, you find out why they didn't. Gee, why weren't you the guy who wrote that article? You know, why was it me? You know, you, if you meet those few other people face-to-face... A lot of them, you know, had connections or had financial situations. They didn't want to endanger their own position by speaking honestly about about such a such an explosive subject. Yeah. Okay. So, I think the number one vegan source. Sorry, I I'm just using nutrition as an example. Do it. Uh, but you know, Dr. Greger is doing the work. He's reading scientific articles, making videos ever almost every day. You know, right. he's really at it every day. 
Um, and there are a lot of people on YouTube already that are vegan YouTubers that just parrot the same studies or parrot the same results that he... Oh, God, is that the truth? Yeah, yeah right. right. So, like, I, in that same sense that there are plenty of people who are parroting the same uh, issues about global warming... Um, yeah, so like there are, no, I think there are enough channels talking about global warming. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, uh, well, it could be something that you could talk about more. I do remember um, one video that you made was pretty left an impact on me. It was, you were talking about like um, it shouldn't be about at least this is how I interpret it. It shouldn't be about reducing your impact as much as yeah. you can, and that did have. I'm saying impact a lot, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Um, it did have an impact on me because for a long time I had been thinking like, okay, how can I right. reduce as much as possible? Like, um, I was really into, and I, I think it is good. I think it is like a positive thing to try to reduce your waste as much as you can. Um, but, uh, as much as I could, I would use, reuse, uh, containers and, uh, go to the grocery store and try to buy things in bulk, uh, which yeah, I still do that. But, um, you know, like I was really still feeling guilty about the impact that I was having on the environment just from like, you know, buying a plastic bag, like, oh, uh, you know, I have, <laughs> I'm contributing to all this harm in the world. Like, right. you know, it, 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 it can lead to just like insanity. Paralysis. Sure, yeah, because right. you're yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah, well, yeah. it's better for me to just be yeah. dead. <laughs> how, I wouldn't be having an impact on the environment. How, negative how dare I How dare I that. write this essay using a disposable pen yeah. I and mean, this kind of mentality, right? right? Well, what if the essay really has some kind of positive value in the world or even has some positive value for quote-unquote saving the world? Yeah. What if you're doing something positive, et cetera? Yeah, so no, right. I, I did a series of videos talking about that. Yeah, so, and I did really appreciate that. So, like, I can understand wanting more content talking about that but um i don't know what you would i i, I don't know like, you don't know what and, i could yeah, more, no, right? no, what would like yeah what else could you say other than well the one the one video i made i just mentioned it, it does say something quite shocking and unexpected i think for many people because it talks about the role of satellites and actually deflecting the solar rays and it's kind of, it actually raises some points that i think most people hadn't heard about and that's that's why i bothered to make that but for me you know i think you raise a second valid and interesting point this issue of there already being people, you know, echoing what Dr. Greger is saying. There's already a kind of chorus of opinion following, you know, a few sources in, uh, in veganism on nutrition. That's interesting. That's true. But what I'm really pointing to is just the existence of the establishment itself, right? So you and I both have seen this YouTube channel for existence. For, for, me. for example, uh, there's a YouTube channel which is specifically climate scientists working on the Arctic methane crisis, the melting of ice on the North Pole, etc. Uh, yeah, it's horrifying. Ar right, right. And then dealing with the consequences of methane being released from the ice, right? Yep. And they're organized as a set of dissidents within the larger community of dedicated salaried climate scientists, climate experts, yep. right? So this is my point. Now, I, I I shared a house with one of those people. I'd say we were roommates, but we had separate rooms. We rented a house in England with a woman, and she was a full-time employee of exactly that, of exactly that demimond, whatever you want to say. She, she was part of the climate science establishment. So she, um, you know, she would joke about it herself. She was actually, you know, producing all these greenhouse gases, flying back and forth to conferences in Switzerland and... South Africa and Australia and stuff. She was going to all these these you know climate science conferences that did get reported in the newspapers. Um, they were big news at the time. Uh, she was part of that of that establishment. Now again, the establishment will have its flaws and it will need to have its critics. The nutrition establishment has its flaws and needs to have its critics. The ancient Greek and Latin profession has its flaws and needs to have its cri cri critics. There's there's no doubt. But for me, that's fundamentally a very different situation than I was in in Northern Laos. And even in the short time that I was involved in Korean Ojibwe, you have no idea. I mean, very quickly, you're in the most informed 1% of Canadians just if you care about and are studying what's going on with Korean Ojibwe people in Canada. 
you know, there should be an establishment. There should be experts and what have you who are involved in those problems. You know, I was especially, you, you know, the issues that are interested in language extinction, education, but also economic and, you know, uh, uh, other, other political problems they were facing. So, you know, there again, uh, you know, there's almost immediately pressure on me to, to speak out, pressure on me to, to lead research projects and so on. I remember people saying to me, look, we can get funding for you right away if you want to start doing this research project or something. And it was like, um, I've been a student here for three months. Like, you know, th thanks. But, you know, I thought, I thought I'd have more of a period of false humility first before, you know, taking on the kind of position. So a lot of the issues I've chosen to engage with are the issues where my voice matters, where the absence of my voice would matter. Again, if I hadn't written that article in Laos, nobody else would have, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, look, and I've got to say also, I do think that is in some ways an immature perspective. I've already been foreshadowing that. I think that was, like I say, why didn't I do Greek and Latin? Why did I do Pali? You know, looking back at it, in some ways, I think it's stupid. And, I mean, now I'm in a situation where I'm 39 years old. I can read and write Chinese. I'm doing all this work on reading and writing Chinese. And my opinion doesn't matter. I'm, I'm one of a million white guys Okay, maybe not a million, but an enormous number of white Westerners who speak English as a first language who've managed to get, you know, some level of ability in Chinese, some knowledge of Chinese politics, etc. And my opinion does not matter. My contribution doesn't matter in that field whatsoever. Well, what does matter is you're, you know, you have an extensive knowledge of history and politics of China. Oh, oh, I'm not humble. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm you know, my, my voice is of... Tremendous, unique value. Oh, there's no question. You didn't learn no. Chinese for business. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not in it to make money and so on. But anyway, right. Um... But, you know, my situation, uh, you know, my contribution will never be valued in that way. Um, it's much, much different to try to compete and make your voice heard and make your contribution matter if you want to debate the future of Chinese politics with over one billion people who are involved. Korean Ojibwe politics, there are not a lot of people in the room. There's a few dozen people, you know, debating with you, and your voice really matters in the absence of your voice. If you can be an eloquent voice, you know, for police reform or prison reform or education reform or language extinction or any of those issues connected to First Nations, your contribution really matters. And in my experience, it matters right away. It matters when you've only been at it for, for a few months when you don't have a whole lot of credentials in your belt. Yeah. And for me, that that's like something like global warming it's the worst case scenario. There's this huge, well-funded establishment already. I'm not a part of it. I'm never going to be a part of it. I'm never going to benefit from it. I'm always going to be excluded by it. Okay. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the situation there. Yeah. And then, and then apart from that, so what, what, can, I, what can I possibly contribute? Yeah. yeah, I do understand, you know, why he may have asked this. Because in this sense, it is so urgent. It seems like the only thing that we should be concerned about. Because, like... Right. First of all, we need we need a planet that can sustain human life. If it can't, you know, if if some of these projections are true that within you know the next hundred years the just the global economy is going to be in shambles due to climate change, you know that is very serious, and I do understand why it's at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, and maybe that's you know that's part of this this uh, urging you on to yeah, talk about yeah, 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 yeah. I sympathize. That's why I'm answering the question. Yeah, right. right. I sympathize, but I disagree. Um, yeah. And, you know, to bring this back to two names that happen to rhyme, Cicero and Monbiot. So I've been reading the ancient Roman philosopher Cicero. Mm -hmm. And in reading Cicero, I have to reflect a lot on the relationship between democracy and aristocracy. And then I was looking at some work by this journalist, Georges Monbiot, the other day. I think Georges Monbiot is an idiot. I really do. Not even going to get into why. But George Monbiot is, in effect, like an aristocrat in our society. He's the one person out of a million chosen almost at random to be the ecology reporter for a major newspaper in Europe. So, I mean, in all of your, how many people have that job? In the whole English-speaking world, how many people have that job? How many people can keep it for decades the way he has? Researching and writing articles and publishing books. And it's a goddamn shame that job went to such an idiot. It really, it really is a shame. That it didn't go to a person of greater rigor, honesty, thoroughness, you know, and intelligence. Because I'm, oh, anyway, I'm not even getting into this guy's, this guy's track record. But anyway, Georges Monbiot, he is, however, absolutely one of the most important voices on global warming. And has been for decades and still is. And he has sometimes gone through in detail 
reports from the United Nations, you know, on global warming or from specific bodies. And he's really criticized them and pointed out what were wrong and their approach or, you know, what they're saying with the issues. And he has an impact. Now, here's the sad fact. So George Mumbi, he's not a climate scientist. This is also a problem. He has no real formal education. He is just a reporter. He's a journalist who happens to specialize in, the, in these areas. Your opinion and my opinion can never matter in the way George Monbiot's opinion matters. Never. And if you take all that time, I have a political science background, I could go through the same reports from the United Nations. I could probably do a better critique, constructive criticism. I could probably contribute better than George Monbiot because George Monbiot is an idiot, right? <laughs> you know, I could go through the same stats. I could go through whether it's scientific reports or political reports or, or, or you know, panels drawing their conclusions. I could play that role, right? But it wouldn't matter. I would have more of a positive impact on ecology and global warming if I take that same time and knit my own socks. Because this is this is why I'm bringing up this is why I'm bringing up philosophy of Cicero, right? This is part of the tragedy of living in a society which is still in bits and pieces aristocratic in its nature. This guy has been given this you know status for life, you know, almost magically. You know, he's one of, like, five people in the English people, but maybe fewer. I, don't, I can't even name five, you know, guys like this. He, he's, a, he's a reporter on ecology. Mm -hmm. And um, so he has that power. And if I wanted to have influence on the issue, those issues, the best thing I could do after doing that research would be to struggle to get that my research into the hands of George Monbiot and pray that he reports on it. Pray that he reports on it and, and gives a citation to my blog or wherever I'm, I'm going to post it. So, I mean, that's, that's the cold, hard reality of how the establishment works. In Buddhist studies, how many white Western English-speaking people get to be a professor of Buddhism in each generation? It's more than 15, but it's a handful, you know? And they really do have this power comparable to aristocrats, and they leave a huge shadow over the next generation. And, you know, I mean, there are ways in which, you know, Western academia and even Western journalism start to resemble aristocracy, start to resemble undeserved privilege, just being assigned to people arbitrarily and then having these these kinds of impacts. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say I was thinking about it recently. You know, uh, your your mom sent you an email saying that she had just read about a report on sexual abuse in humanitarian workers. Right. Um, yeah. And she said, this reminded me that you, you wrote something along these same lines 10 years ago yeah. you know why did that not get more coverage and uh, <laughs> I, right yeah i mean that's just how it is like you well, you have written some like yeah okay yeah, yeah, yeah i'm yeah. biased I, but like, i, thought it I did, think yeah. your writing is is like some of the things that you've published are incredible yeah, but how many people have read them how many people are going to read them and uh it, that's just how that's just how it is. Okay, so I, I'll wrap the video over this, but you know, yeah. you make a good point. Although I I disagree, or I see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So she's talking about an article I did on corruption, sexual exploitation. You know, uh, employees of humanitarian agencies yeah. getting underage girls pregnant. This kind of this kind of situation in, in northern Laos. So that article did make a big impact. It made a huge impact within Laos. It made a huge impact on the charity agencies involved, the agencies I was accusing, I was pointing the finger at, whatever you want to say, I was criticizing, right? And then it had a big impact via the newspapers in the donor countries. So one of the agencies was from France, and the story was picked up and run in France, and then one was uh, Norway. So in Norway, Finland, and Denmark, I think, the story got picked up also, okay. right? Cool. So no, so it's totally, I totally understand why you That's see good. it that way. You yeah. see it as me heroically writing this article and then not having any impact, which I totally understand. But actually, but actually, if you think about it, this is an example of a powerless, voiceless person having a huge impact, especially where it mattered. And then the ultimate impact was that it had an impact on the Laotian government itself. The government in that country, Laos, my message got through to them, which is a communist dictatorship. That's good. So getting, getting through. Okay, but this is my point. Glad Before, <laughs> no, 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 but it, it is interesting. And of course, there's limits. I mean, I don't have as much impact as Georges Monbiot or some other established journalist, no question. Right. But... My fundamental point throughout this video has been I don't respond to the existence of the establishment just with resentment, nor with resignation, right? The point was for me to respond strategically and say, okay, where can I make a difference? So like when I, when I moved to Canada last time, when I moved to Saskatchewan, my first thought was prison activism. I'm going to get involved in prison reform activism. 
You know, now I know maybe I'm an unusual person. Nobody else does that. So like, okay, I want to get involved with, with prison activism, prison education, and, and this this kind of thing. Political activism linked to prisons. Why? This is somewhere I can make a difference, and I would not have put the same time or energy or effort into global warming. So again, whether you see this as empowering or disempowering, what your attitude is in response to the existence of the establishment, because the establishment is real. There is an establishment of Greek and Latin you know, scholars. Do you see that as an opportunity? Because for me, hey, I'm a, I'm a smart guy. I could have gotten a you know, scholarship to study Greek and Latin. You could look at it positively and say, hey, I can use the establishment as a ladder. I can get ahead because this, this establishment already creates opportunities for me, creates education for me. Whereas, let me tell you something, languages like Pali, Laotian, and Cambodian, I taught myself with no teacher, no textbook, made my own textbooks and posed them to the internet. It was awful. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Also awful. You know, <laughs> you know with no establishment, total autodidact, total outsider... You know, very different situation, but how can I make my words count? How can I make my reading count? My, how can I make my research count? And in a very broad sense, how can I make my activism count? So I make those decisions strategically in response to the existence of that establishment. Whether or not you resent it ultimately is immaterial. But no, I'm neither taking on the Georges Monbiot's of this world, nor am I taking on the global warming establishment. And that's why that is not a major area of critique or commentary on this channel.